Thank you all. Um, there are errors in the book. I list them on my website. Most of them don't really um, change how you... <laughs> I did get the um, William Henry Fitzhugh Lee and Fitzhugh Lee confused at least twice, if not three times. Um, I must apologize about that. I also got Grant's arrival at uh, Shiloh wrong. Um, his friends all said he arrived at like 7.30 or 8. Um, I said 9 o'clock, and it turns out it was actually 9.30, according to one of the logbooks of the, one of the two um, gunboats that was there. So uh, there's always something new to find out in the Civil War. So fake news is not a modern concept. <laughs> and mm-hmm. Is it not on? Orange thingy there. Okay. Oh. Mm. Um, no. Um, what, what orange thingy are we talking about? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So, fake news is not a modern concept. It was especially widespread during the American Civil War, and Ulysses S. Grant indulged in a great deal of it throughout the conflict and especially in his personal memoirs, no matter what you might have heard a month ago. So, my expose highlights the deficiencies in Grant's generalship and his character even though Grant promised to provide a true account and not to be unjust, um, but his contemporary writings all too often contradict him, um, and it's really evident. Um, it's um, sort of plain to see, and I'll try to show you that right up here in his own writing. So, as president and general, um, Ulysses Grant had a tremendous impact in war and in peace. Much that he did was praiseworthy. He had an extraordinary life. But many people say that Grant won the war. The devil is in the detail. If you really look closely, you find it really isn't so. There's five major factors that are often ignored um, in his exalted reputation. Um, his staffer, John Rawlins, the Union naval power, the fortunes of war, or luck as you'd call it, Grant's favoritism, and his unreliability as a chronicler of events. Now, Grant's regular US Army service um, included highly creditable work in the Mexican War, but it ended in a cloud of alcohol on the West Coast. He generally failed in civilian affairs afterwards. But the Civil War restarted his military career, and it was done through politics. Now, Congressman Elihu Washburn and several other influential Illinoisans helped Grant secure work in Springfield, Illinois, and got him command of a regiment. Um, yet, in his second inaugural address, Grant denied the importance of this crucial political support. He said that he was entirely without such influence or acquaintance. Um, he had even considered baking bread instead of fighting before he got his colonelcy, and he refused anything inferior that he thought was inferior to a colonelcy. During his later world tour, Grant erroneously proclaimed, when the rebellion came, I returned to the service because it was a duty. I had no thought of rank. That is untrue. Um, Grant knew the value of rank in the war. Um, without fighting a battle, Grant was promoted to Brigadier General in the Volunteers at Elihu Washburn's behest. Um, Congressman Washburn supported him politically throughout the war, and Grant might have disappeared if it wasn't for Washburn. And Washburn's reward for doing this? Grant ignored him and his importance in the memoirs. Luckily, Grant was assigned to John Fremont's Western Department where Grant was only ranked by John Pope and Fremont himself. If he had been assigned to the Army of the Potomac instead, 10 new brigadiers and several new major generals would have ranked him. Now, Paducah is the first major incident where the memoirs falsified Civil War history. Um, in early September 1861, Confederate General Leonidas Polk breached Kentucky's self-proclaimed uh, neutrality by occupying the Mississippi River town of Columbus. There's a tar artillery could be emplaced on the Mississippi Bluffs there and stop any uh, Union downriver uh, naval traffic. But if Polk was doing, uh, was foolish in breaking like uh, 
Kentucky's neutrality, then Grant and Fremont were equally foolish because they wanted to do the same. Polk just beat them to it. So Fremont's spy had convinced Grant to occupy Paducah when he heard about it and to do it ahead of the enemy. Grant later boasted in his memoirs that he set off before receiving permission from Fremont. That seems to be untrue. Uh, messages in the official records indicate that Grant had gotten and responded to Fremont's orders, and Grant has an unsubmitted report in the Library of Congress that no one seems to know about. It states that, I received Fremont's authorization and I replied the same day. Um, Grant chose many inferior men, they were drinking men for a large part, as his staff members. But he made no mistake in John Rawlins choosing him as assistant adjutant general. And almost everybody said so. These are all quotes from like people who knew them both. And Grant himself called them indispensable. And other staffers said the same. Some people even said worse, that Rawlins was like sort of better than Grant. Um, he was like completely loyal. And Grant Rawlins' reward for his indispensable services throughout the war, Grant almost entirely excluded him, even though he's loyal, self-effacing, hardworking. Um, the murmurs just don't include his vital contributions. Grant's biographers even minimize and add insult to the injury. Jeffrey Perre said that Rawlins was a man incapable of loyalty. And even more obtusely, Bruce Catton protested, with a defender like Rawlins, Grant had no need of any enemies. Grant likewi likewise ignored his essential advocate, Charles Dana, in his memoirs, and he turned the support of Henry Halleck into an adversary and, and an incompetent. It's because he found out that Halleck um, had possibly uh, sent or did send rumors of his drinking to McClellan, and that, I guess, annoyed Grant after the war, and Grant went, or Halleck went from being a friend and a great general to being persona non grata. So luckily for Grant, a, a powerful fleet of transports and gunboats concentrated around Cairo, Illinois. These steam-driven transports moved and supplied his armies, and a flotilla of wooden clads and ironclads overpowered enemy forts and broke up the enemy lines of communication. Now the Confederates could never compete with the Union's naval superiority, superiority throughout the conflict, in coastal operations, through the increasingly stringent blockade, or on the western rivers where Grant was. Now as to Grant's vaunted common sense or keen grasp of strategy, just before being assigned to Cairo, he bemoaned, I should like to be sent to western Virginia, but my lot seems to be cast in this part of the world. He then wanted to dis, um, descend the Mississippi River when ascending the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers was much more practical. And for one reason, a gunboat that was disabled by enemy fire when you're fighting downstream on the Mississippi, the gunboat would have floated into enemy hands. If you're fighting upstream and gets disabled, it comes back to safety. So Fremont was replaced by um, Henry Halleck, who was a West Pointer and who was prejudiced against so-called political generals, and Grant shared some of that prejudice. And there was Charles F. Smith, who was yet another West Pointer, who was placed under Grant, and Grant showed him favoritism whenever possible. And the switch from Fremont to Halleck gave Grant an opportunity to lead an army down the Mississippi just like he wanted to in early November. And this was before he could be displaced by a higher ranking officer. So he basically went into battle, I think, hoping to preserve or augment his rank. So despite distinct orders not to, Grant challenged the Confederates to battle. Um, Grant's infantry, and with better artillery, overran the Confederates' camp. But Grant lost control of his men and the enemy got away. Then the Confederates sent more men across the river and Grant was forced to cut his way out and the retreat turned into a rout and the rear of his columns suffered severely. But luckily the gunboats, two gunboats were there to provide pr protection. The transports cut their hawsers and Grant escaped. Now, even though he was, um, they had roughly equal casualties and Grant you know, had to run away from the battlefield, he got back and informed headquarters that victory was most complete. He told his wife and his father, oh sorry, he told his victory was complete to headquarters and to his wife and father that it was most complete. Then in 1864, Grant submitted a revised report to the one he did right after the battle. And this is basically a forgery. 
He backdated it from 1864 to November 17, 1861. It had an anachronistic heading and addressee. Lieutenant General Grant signed it Brigadier General Grant, and it contained two outright fabrications to justify his insubordination and attacking. Now, negligence was basically a lifetime habit of Grant, along with indolence, which he conf um, confessed to later on. But his biographers overlooked th uh, overlook this. And they always argue that Grant was not personally corrupt. But in Cairo, two ringleaders um, under his regime um, just basically engaged in all sorts of fraud. His quartermaster, Reuben Hatch, who was the brother of one of those influential Illinoisans who helped secure Grant's colonelcy, and George Washington Graham, Grant's Commodore of Riverboats, um, swindled um, bread, lumber, cordwood, shingles, ice, coal, oats, hay, and the riverboats. Um, Grant admitted these great abuses, but then as things got a little closer, he started to stall Hatch's court-martial, so the facts never really came out. Stanton, Secretary of War Stanton, sent an eminent committee. They found gross fraud. Assistant Secretary of War Scott, um, after examining the books, he thought it was strange that army officers would certify to such corruption, meaning Grant. A man named William Counts arrived to take care of things, and he replaced Graham and started investigating the contracts. In a very short time, the quote goes, his explorations appeared to trouble Grant, who placed him under arrest, and Wash Graham was reinstated. But Grant's delay in the court-martial and the investigation let politicians convince Lincoln to handpick three auditors, including Charles Dana, and who soon became Grant's fervent supporter. Um, the author of the Sultana tragedy wrote, it is not surprising that Lincoln's hand-picked commission acquitted Hatch of all blame. It also exculpated Graham and Grant's management at Cairo as well. So Grant then glowingly endorsed Hatch's return as he was entirely exonerated. But at the war's end, Hatch was serving as a quartermaster down in Vicksburg. He overloaded the transport Sultana with returning um, prisoners of war from the southern prison camps. The overloaded transport went up the Mississippi above Memphis. It blew up and there were about 16 to 1,800 victims. So Grant's favoritism seemed to have its costs. Now, although Grant is often credited, many others had the idea for movements up the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers. And Halleck was not unsupportive of this movement. Naval officer Andrew Foote was also um, in favor. Grant preferred to uh, um, assault Fort Donaldson first, but he yielded to um, Andrew Foote in trying Fort Henry first. So Foote's gunboats alone captured Fort Henry because Grant did not heed, heed Foote's advice to start his men earlier, and the garrison escaped because of this. But many applaud Grant alone for the victory, leaving Andrew Foote out of it. At Fort Donelson, um, Grant didn't know how many, it's oh, th thank you very much. Um, so at Fort Donelson, Grant did not know how many Confederates were at the fort or who their commander was, even though he said so in his memoirs. But he aggressively led his army across to Fort Donaldson, and uh, he then pushed Foote into a premature naval attack. Um, it failed. Um, so the Confederates knocked out several of Foote's ironclads. Grant didn't know what to do. The next day, he um, visited Foote on Foote's flagship. Grant was incommunicado for about six hours, just at the time that the Confederates counterattacked and tried to break out of um, the Confederate or the Federal siege. Grant had left no orders to his subordinates except to maintain their positions. Um, so the Confederates were pushing out on the green lines and pushed uh, McLaren's troops right out of the way, opening up the roads heading toward Nashville or further south to escape. Luckily, Lew Wallace's division was sent first Cruft and then the rest of the division under Lew himself to help support um, McLaren, and they stopped the Confederate advance and in the end uh, pushed them back. But even though Lew Wallace basically saved the day for Grant, he doesn't get the credit. Um, and the Confederates foolishly decided to give up their escape route and they just retreated back into the fort. So Grant had a bit of luck there. After noon, Grant finally arrived and he ordered attacks on both flanks. And that was smart and it caused rebels to surrender the next day. But Foote and Wallace rarely share in the credit for this victory also. Um, Halleck pushed Grant for a major generalcy, 
and this placed Grant very high up in the rankings. But after Fort Donaldson, Halleck became annoyed with Grant. His undisciplined army was plundering Fort Donaldson. Captured Confederates were escaping just by walking through the lines. Um, Grant had left his army behind to go visit Buell in Nashville, so he said. And he didn't provide uh, Halleck with the army's strength reports. There were also indications that Grant was drinking again. Due to these factors, Halleck removed Grant from command of the Tennessee River expedition that he was planning. So John McLaren, um, Charles Smith, and uh, Lew Wallace um, all received major generalcies after Grant, and they would figure largely in this next advance. But Halleck gave Smith command of this expedition instead of McLaren, who outranked Smith. But Halleck was also not Grant's jealous tormentor, as many people say, and he soon let Grant retake command of the expedition. So Grant started out well um, when he re uh, reached Savannah, and uh, he took the troops off the um, transports where Smith had left them, and he moved them up to Pittsburgh Landing and Shiloh Church, um, and concentrating them from the enemy. Now, the enemy was also concentrating just 20 miles away, one good day's march. Yet, Grant did very little to uh, protect his army from this. Um, he was staying in a mansion in Savannah, 10 miles downriver from his army, and he really made mistake after mistake. He neglected his army and ignored proper precautions, despite thinking that the Confederates outnumbered him two to one. He stopped sending out spies and scouts, sent out few patrols, no mounted vedettes out in front, he put his two uh, newest and least experienced divisions at the front lines. He didn't emplace his artillery. He switched his artillery and cavalry units at the last minute. He transferred commanders at the last minute, um, basically for favoritism purposes. He didn't entrench. He didn't construct entanglements or clear fields of fire. The day before battle, Grant postponed meeting Buell, and that was the whole point, supposedly, of his staying in Savannah. I mean, he knew that Buell was sort of stuck behind the Duck River at Columbia. It wouldn't be there for a couple of weeks, a little week at least. He just stayed down in Savannah waiting for Buell, it said. When Buell arrives, Grant says, nope, can't meet you today, you know, maybe tomorrow. Nelson, um, Buell's first division arrived at Savannah, and Nelson wanted to get right up to the front. He was thinking that, you know, Grant's army was in danger. Grant said, no, you can't march through the uh, swamps. There's, so the swamps are this whole area um, oh, on the side of the river. So from Savannah, um, Grant was thinking, well, if anybody had to march through, they could march through the swamps like this, but he said they were impassable at first. So the Confederates assaulted in a great surprise attack, and uh, it could have been sort of the Pearl Harbor of the war. He found the Union camps um, seriously underprepared or unprepared. And the first day, April 6th, was nearly a catastrophe, and only Everett Peabody's insubordinate patrol early that morning prevented a total surprise, and Peabody saved Grant's army. Having um, heard uh, reports of the battle, hearing the um, artillery, Grant ordered Nelson to march through those same swamps that he told him the day before that he couldn't do. And he merely notified Buell that the battle had begun. He didn't seem to want Buell's army sort of engaged in action. Grant hardly went upriver on his flagship, the Tigris, and he stopped at uh, Crump's Landing midway um, to talk to Lew Wallace, who had a division strung out along the roads here. Lew Wallace was saying, okay, there's a fight upstream, you know, should I go? And Grant said, no, you just be ready to um, move in any direction whatsoever. Um, then another ship came down from Pittsburgh Landing and told Grant, there's definitely a fight going on. Grant heard the news, but did he send the ship down to uh, Lou Wallace at Crump's Landing and say, come on up now? No. Did he send the ship down further to Buell and tell Buell that, you know, you n I need your army now, we were under attack? No. Grant even got to Pittsburgh Landing and he still didn't even send all the transports that were at Pittsburgh Landing, there were none at uh, Savannah. And uh, he just seemed like he was going to keep uh, Buell out of the battle and try to do it all himself. So Grant, I think, went to the front and talked to Sherman. And finally, he sent back orders for Lew Wallace to basically come to the right of the army where Sherman was. So Sherman is number five, 
his three brigades there, and there's a bridge over Owl Creek. So Wallace back here said, okay, to get to the right of the army, I will take this route to get there. Now, Grant later said, oh, I didn't order him to the right of the army. That's not where I wanted him or, you know, told him to go. But basically, everybody else said, yes, it was. Baxter, who took the orders down to Wallace, Wallace himself, the people who saw the orders with Wallace, two of the staff officers that Grant had sent to find Wallace, Sherman said it, Grant's little pet biographer, Bado. <laughs> Basically, everybody said that Grant sent him to the right of the army, but Grant said, no, no, never did such a thing. Um, some other people did say to the left or the rear of Smith's division. Grant just would say Pittsburgh Landing. Though I think later on he once said to the left of Sherman, but when he wrote his memoirs, he said, the right of Sherman is not where I ordered him or where I wanted him to go. So he was just like making uh, Wallace a scapegoat for his own mistakes at Shiloh. Um, Grant's memoirs lied about this and many other events during Shiloh. He wrote, during the whole of Sunday, the first day, I was continuously engaged in passing from one part of the field to another, giving directions to division commanders. Well, the division commanders don't agree. Hurlbert said he saw him once, got no orders. Sherman, many times he and Grant said, oh yes, I met Sherman early on in the battle around 10 o'clock, but neither of them said they got any orders whatsoever. McLaren said he didn't even see Grant that day. Uh, Prentice did get an order, he said, hold at all hazards. And that was in the hornet's nest. Okay, it's not telling him to do anything besides stay where you are, but it was an order. And Grant um, didn't give any orders, basically brigadier the, the brigade commanders. So this was like the one order he gave at a uh, high level. Prentice, in a speech after the war, that Grant's memoir is actually vouched for as correct, he remarked that, Grant's know that Grant knows that I communicated to him at four o'clock at the landing and tried to get reinforcements. So Prentice is in the hornet's nest and both of the divisions on um, Prentice's flanks are falling back. So he's sort of being left out alone. He asked for reinforcements and he received orders from Grant to hold on. And he goes, I held. So Prentice, as everybody knows, got captured in the hornet's nest with 2,200 people. Um, so what does Grant do? He tried to scapegoat um, uh, Prentice by saying, oh yes, in the memoirs, he goes, in one of the backward moves, Prentice like failed to move back and got himself captured. And actually, if Grant told him to hold on once and then twice, it's Grant's fault that Prentice did this, but Grant was always looking for a scapegoat if it wasn't one of his friends. Um, so on April 7th, the second day, Grant was reinforced by Lew Wallace's division, and he was joined by three of Buell's division. A fourth division of Buell arrived at the very end, but never really took much part in the action. Grant never took command over Buell or his army, um, even though uh, Halleck had given him a dis dis distinct authorization to do so if he wanted. And, uh, Really, Buell did the bulk of the fighting on the second day, and between the two of them, they forced the enemy to retreat back to Corinth. But Grant even forgot that Buell's divisions were on the field, except for Nelson's. So he certainly wasn't in command of them, or had a very bad memory. So after the battle was over, Grant claimed the victory. He even wrote, as to the talk of a surprise here, nothing could be more false. If the enemy had sent us word when and where they would attack us, we could not have been better prepared. That's one of the balder lies in Civil War history. Um, and also in his memoirs, he basically said, oh, well, Peabody's um, patrol, he didn't mention Peabody by name, but he said the uh, Federals started the fight. So that sort of shows there was no surprise here. You know? Don't look behind the curtain. So all the Federal divisions performed well. Grant ignored others, but he praised the wounded uh, Sherman. Sherman had a buckshot wound in his finger. Grant said it was a severe wound. And Sherman was responsible for much of the surprise and the lack of preparations, because Grant made him the de facto commander um, in the days leading up to the battle, even though McLaren at the end outranked Sherman. McLaren didn't put up a fuss, um, but Sherman gets the glory. Then Grant, after the uh, battle, said that, I am looking for a speedy move. One more fight than easy sailing to the end of the war. Um, then he said the next big battle, the last one in the Mississippi River. 
Valley. In his personal memoirs, though, he changed this all around because he knew how the Civil War actually turned out. He said, I gave up all idea except by, you know, defeating them by complete conquest. So Grant was really just making it up as he uh, felt like it. Um, then in the slow advance to uh, Corinth, which, you know, everybody blames Halleck for, um, Grant had no problems with it. He was really just sort of sulking in his tent because uh, Halleck put George Thomas in command of his frontline troops. He made uh, Grant second in command, even though Grant still had charge of Thomas's troops and the reserve. He just sort of, you know, I think sort of stayed back and wasn't engaged in the uh, campaign. But he did have some comments on it. He said, slow but sure, you know, we're doing good work here, you know, not, not, nothing is really wrong. Um, slowly but in a way to ensure success. After Corinth was captured, he even said, there's going to be much unjust criticism of this affair. Okay? It's supposed to be a great victory, he called it. I'm sorry, can you see? Yeah, no, no. Okay. So, what happens in his memoirs? I could have captured Corinth in two days. And he's just trying to make Halleck look like a slow boat who, you know, did everything wrong. That's not what he said at the time. Um, and then uh, Ayuka, his sort of next big battle, um, Rosecrans was, he's the one who came up with a plan, was going to come in from behind and cut off the Confederate escape route from Ayuka, but Grant was supposed to send Orden first to attract the enemy attention so that Rosecrans wouldn't ha have to fight them all. But unfortunately, um, Grant was in his Burnsville headquarters. He sort of stayed incommunicado with Rosecrans for about 30 hours. There are two second-hand reports that Grant was drunk at the time. He never sent Ord to uh, attack. In fact, he even sent, had Ord send in a flag of truce um, trying to get the Confederates to surrender because of Antietam, saying, oh, Antietam is such a great victory. You guys better surrender. Well, the Confederates didn't bite on that. And because of that, Ord didn't attack when he was supposed to. Rosecrans was coming up, you know, ignorant of the fact. The Confederates attacked him, but still Rosecrans won a victory. Hard fought, but he did. So what did Grant say about this? Okay, right after the battle, energy and skill displayed by General Rosecrans. Okay, he likes Rosecrans. But it, within one month, the Battle of Corinth, the second Battle of Corinth was fought, where Rosecrans won another victory. He's getting all the press. He's getting, you know, the praise. Also, the reports of Grant being drunk at Iuka had hit the newspapers. Um, so Grant, of course, didn't like this, and he didn't like Rosecrans or Rosecrans' reporter, so he changed his mind. He said, now, Hamilton, who uh, was doing the fighting, G give Hamilton the credit. It was one month later. But when his memoirs rolled around, he changed it again. He made this seem like a defeat. Instead of uh, Iuka being a federal victory, now Rosecrans did badly, losing all these men. So Grant would really change history whenever it suited his purposes. Um, the Vicksburg operations uh, showed Grant and his favoritism again and again. He and Halleck got together and basically excluded McClernand, who Abraham Lincoln had chosen as the uh, commander of the Downriver Mississippi expedition that was supposed to capture Vicksburg. And they tried to get Sherman to take over instead. Well, Sherman did. He led the troops down there before um, McClernand could arrive and he led them into a bloody defeat at Chickasaw Bluffs, number two. Grant, in the meantime, was up here at number one making the overland advance, but uh, Van Doren's cavalry got around him, destroyed his uh, supply depot at Holly Springs. Grant blamed the commander at Holly Springs, but actually he bore much of the fault too because he wasn't giving good orders about what was going to happen. Um, a cavalry uh, expedition he sent out didn't do its job. So Grant deserves some of that uh, blame. He doesn't get it, of course. So McLaren arrives on the field, and he, at number three, brings the army upriver and captures uh, Arkansas Post at Fort Hinman, <coughs> 5,000 Confederate prisoners. So it was a pretty big victory. Grant heard about it, though, and he called it a, um, a wild goose chase. But then Sherman said, no, 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 I'm the one who came up with that idea. Well, McClernand came up with it too, but Grant heard Sherman say, oh, I came up with the idea. So then Grant said, oh yeah, this was a very good idea. I'm glad that we did it. Um, Grant was going to give uh, McClernand no credit if he could possibly avoid it. 
So now it came time to go back trying to capture Vicksburg. And Grant tried scheme after scheme to get either past Vicksburg to the south or get to the bluffs to the north so we can get on the high land and come at Vicksburg from behind. Good idea. He tried to um, prosecute a canal that had been started the year before and that failed through engineering difficulties and Grant's um, spreading out of his resources. He told McPherson to start another canal for on a really long roundabout trip. That one failed through bad engineering and McPherson was an engineer. He sent a staffer up to break the levee uh, Yazoo Pass. And at first he just wanted the gunboats to go up and break some bridges on the Confederate railroads, but then he thought better of it and a couple weeks later he's like pushing more men, by then it was too late. They were stopped at Fort Pemberton. So that failed. They blamed that one on the Navy. So while that was failing, he decided with Porter to send Porter's gunboats up here to help his Fort uh, Yazoo Pass expedition. Well, that failed too, they got stuck up. Uh, Porter almost had to scuttle his gunboat fleet, but uh, luckily Sherman arrived in time to save him from that. Grant then tried to do another canal down at Duckport. That one failed. Bad engineering and the river fell. One bit of great luck was Grierson's raid, number nine, coming down here on this dotted line. Now it turned out to be perfectly timed for Grant's purposes. Got in behind Pemberton at Vicksburg, Pemberton didn't know what was going on. Um, it sort of worked perfectly, except that Grant didn't really care that it happened when it did. When Hur Hurlbert, who's um, commanding up here, asked Grant, like, when do you want me to send down Grierson? Grant said, I don't care, it doesn't matter. So that was just a, a bit of luck on Grant's part. And in the end, he crossed the river downstream of Vicksburg, <coughs> did a very um, commendable job, marching overland to Jackson and then back to Vicksburg, surrounding the Confederate position at Vicksburg, and eventually winning the day. Um, so that's all well and good, but usually you only hear the last part about him crossing the river and, you know, passing Vicksburg with his gunboats. Basically he did that because he was sort of forced to. Um, in the beginning he was saying things like, okay, the Lake Providence Canal under McPherson was the most practicable. And then he said that the Yazoo Pass expedition and the Steels Bayou <coughs> were also hopefully going to turn into something good. But in his memoirs, he said just the opposite. I never had great confidence in these things. Now, not only that, at the time um, before he went down past Vicksburg, um, he was saying, okay, these schemes are failing. There's nothing left to do but to attack Haynes Bluff. And that's where Sherman came to grief uh, months earlier. He said the same thing to Sherman. He said, little calculation by any other route than Haynes Bluff, okay? So everybody thinks, you know, if you read that, you'd know that, you know, his passing Vicksburg at the end was really just um, his last gamble because he realized that Haynes Bluff is much too tough to do. What does he say in his memoirs? I had in contempl um, contemplation the whole winter of movement to a point below Vicksburg. That's really quite untrue and it's proved by his own writings. Um, basically Rollins and McLaren and I think James Wilson um, had the idea and probably just convinced Grant of it when all the other schemes failed and there's really nothing left to do. Um, so, there was one other controversy in uh, Vicksburg that I talk about, especially in my book. It's the Satarsha incident where Grant got drunk on the Yazoo River. And three people wrote um, about it. Sylvanus Cadwallader, his little pet reporter, said that Grant had uh, been drinking heavily, was stupid in speech and staggering in gait, became sober by morning, but got drunk again the next day. Grant's protege James Harrison, or sorry, James Harrison Wilson, wrote that General G intoxicated in his journal. Now that's a friend of his, a protege, the same day, or apparently the same day that, you know, it happened. And Dana, who said that Cadwalder wasn't on the trip, he wrote that Grant got as stupidly drunk as the immortal nature of man would allow. Okay. No, no, nobody said that Grant was sober. There's nobody you know, who said, oh no, I saw Grant that day and he was sober. Um, so you'd think that the evidence is against him. Grant, or Rollins even wrote before Grant had embarked that it looked like he had been drinking. 
then Ulysses', Ulysses friend, Dr. Cato, who was also his family physician back in Galena, and served under him in the early years of the war, he wrote that Grant was addicted to the use of strong drink during the early years of the war. And he said that the allegations of Grant yielding to his old habits at the time of the Yazoo um, River ex uh, debacle were founded entirely on facts. And there's other um, evidence in the ship's logs on the Yazoo River at the time that indicate that what Sylvanus Cadwallader said was true. Another thing that's misconstrued in the history books is Grant's treatment of black soldiers. Um, he did raise black regiments like Lincoln and the administration wanted him to do, but he kept the troops out of the fight whenever possible. He usually had them, as in the Vicksburg campaign, just guarding the plantations across the river. In fact, three or four regiments of blacks were being sort of butchered by a Confederate attack until some gunboats arrived to save them while um, Grant was on his Yazoo drinking binge. Um, Grant then said that this was like the first battle in which, you know, blacks really participated in the war, but that was wrong too. He probably just forgot about Port Hudson. And everybody knows how important Port Hudson was. Um, and then in the Overland Campaign, Grant continued to take, um, keep the blacks out of the action. Um, there's one division under Burnside, and they were given the order just to uh, follow the supply train, keep the supply train safe. And then after Wilderness and uh, Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, after the white troops were like just beaten up and decimated and exhausted, he still didn't put them into action. Um, even at the crater, when uh, Burnside wanted the black troops to go first, both he and Meade said, nope, nope, can't have the blacks go first. Um, and even afterwards, uh, Grant was never a real strong supporter of blacks until he became president. And then blacks were Republicans down south, and he changed his mind. So after that, um, he was a strong supporter of civil rights. You have to give him credit for that. He was on the right side of history, but he might have done it for the wrong reasons. Uh, that you can't really tell. But Grant said even as late as August 1863 that, I never was an abolitionist, not even what could be called anti-slavery. So that's pretty late in the war to not even be anti-slavery. Um, if you have time for one more battle or two. Um, do we have time for more? Okay. So after William Rosecrans was defeated at Chickamauga, Grant was appointed to command the new military division of the Mississippi. And that combined the armies of the Tennessee, of the Cumberland, and of the Ohio. And Rosecrans was the commander of the Cumberland. But um, as we know, Grant hated Rosecrans and he replaced him with George Thomas. He didn't like Thomas much either, but he hated Rosecrans worse. So Chattanooga is really an amphitheater, and the Union troops from Rosecrans' army were surrounded in the amphitheater. They were in the city of Chattanooga. There were Confederates on Mission Ridge, or Missionary Ridge, 300 feet high, nice and imposing, and Lookout Mountain, which is even more it's higher and much more imposing with like a palisade and steep cliffs. So um, with the rugged ca um, Cumberland plateau, behi plateau behind them, there's only one tenuous route for Rosecrans to be resupplied. But he and Baldy Smith planned a new route. And when Thomas got into a uh, command, he immediately ordered it into action the very evening. Um, Grant concurred with this a few days later. It was directed by Thomas. Um, and Smith and Joe Hooker were the ones who uh, uh, led the troops. It worked to perfection. Hooker came up from the uh, railroad bridgehead and came this way. And before then, Smith had troops float down on pan pontoons to here. They built a pontoon bridge. They got a bridgehead going. And they got control of this. So now supplies could come in this way to Chattanooga and save the starving ar army of the Cumberland. So how did Grant treat this? Merely he just concurred, and he didn't do anything once he got there. His staff said, oh, um, we had little to do once Grant arrived, even though that was when the Cracker Line was uh, happening. So Grant, in the beginning, at the time, said, oh, yeah, Thomas did set it afoot before I came. And then he said that, oh, yes, it's imminently successful in the days right after. But in his memoirs, he said, 
That night, I issued the orders for opening the route to Bridgeport, and I got the Army of the Cumberland into a comfortable position. So he took the credit from Thomas and Rosecrans and Baldy Smith and Hooker, four people he didn't like, and took it all himself. So when the battle was getting ready to start, um, Thomas took the uh, Orchard Knob, which became the new headquarters for the Federals, and uh, Sherman was marching up and over the bridge, <laughs> hiding behind the hills, and uh, he was going to be the mainstay of Grant's plan. They'd build some pontoons again, cross the river with pontoons in a boat, get onto the north end of Missionary Ridge, and roll the Confederates right down the ridge. What Thomas was supposed to do was send two divisions up to help Sherman. They'd get up here, advance the ridge, and they'd come down the front of the ridge. So that was Grant's plan. Sherman was going to win the battle coming right down the ridge. Didn't turn out that way. Instead, one of uh, Sherman's divisions got held up in uh, the valley here when the bridge broke. Hooker wanted to fight the whole time. Grant was trying to keep Hooker out of the action. But now Hooker had enough troops, and Thomas said, yeah, go ahead and take the Count Mountain if you want to. So in the Battle Above the Clouds, Hooker was, did a really great job sending one um, or two brigades like right down to flank the enemy. Some more men came in here. Um, it forced the Confederates to evacuate the mountain. The same day, even with that as a diversion, Sherman successfully crossed, but then slowly went along here, got onto the wrong hill, never got to Tunnel Hill like he was supposed to. He stopped too soon, even though there's really nothing in front of him at the time, and he blew his opportunity. So that's how the day ended. And the next day, Grant still was interested in having Sherman win the battle. He had Thomas send more troops up to Tunnel Hill, and Sherman just attacked piecemeal. Used maybe one third of his troops, sent them in a brigade at a time. Claiborne and Hardy repulsed him easily, like 10 to 1 casualties. Sherman was getting nowhere. Hooker was having a little trouble because the Confederates burned the bridges over uh, Chattanooga Creek, so he was held up a bit. Thomas had wanted him to uh, swing like a gate on the Missionary Ridge from the south along with some of the troops of Thomas's army here. That never happened. Uh, Grant even took one of Thomas's divisions from here where they were hopefully swinging like a gate and he um, sent them up to uh, Sherman. Sherman didn't need them. Sherman had enough troops anyway. Sherman sent them back again where they arrived in the center just in time. Grant was sitting here on Orchard Knob with Thomas, and he said, Thomas, send two divisions, Wood and Sheridan, up to the rifle pits at the bottom of the ridge, because he was hoping for diversion to help Sherman break through. He still wanted Sherman to win the battle. Thomas delayed for an hour, because for one thing, you don't want to have two divisions sitting at the bottom of a 300-foot ridge when the Confederates had artillery all across the top, men entrenched slightly on the top, and even in the middle. That'd just be like shooting sardines in a can. So Thomas delayed for an hour, and Hooker was finally making it over the bridge and getting up to Rossville Gap to turn north. Grant ordered them again to do so, but now all four divisions that Thomas had went forward. And I'm pretty sure that it was Thomas who got the other two divisions going, as well as the original two that uh, Grant had ordered. Those four divisions, especially with uh, Hooker rolling up the Confederate flank at the same time, they miraculously ascended the ridge, sent the Confederates flying, won a great victory. Uh, Grant at the time said, okay, Sherman, Thomas has beaten the enemy off the ridge in his front. Now is your time to attack. Do so. Sherman didn't do so. Sherman just sort of sat there the rest of the day. So Grant's plan for the battle was, was set out on November 18th like five days before the battle began. And he said that Sherman was to effect a crossing and secure the heights and everything, and the junctures formed and the ridge was supposed to be carried. Well, that didn't happen, as we saw. But in his memoirs, he said just the opposite. He says that his recollection is that his orders were as fought, that Sherman was going to get on Missionary Ridge, that Hooker was supposed to get to Rossville. That was never part of the plan. That was just Grant making it up. And then he said when Hooker did that, the Army of the Cumberland was to assault in the center. That's also just made up. Grant was 
fabricating uh, the whole battle. In the overland campaign, I'll just go through very quickly because this is sort of Grant's, you know, defeat of Lee, some people call it, that, you know, he really defeated the Army of Northern Virginia and they had nothing left after this and it was just a matter of time. But Grant basically maneuvered five times and fought the enemy five times in this period. Each of the maneuvers was a failure, and four out of the five battles were really defeats. Only at North Anna could it be called a draw. Oops. So at um, the crossing of the Rapidan, he could have gone through the wilderness in one day, or at least not fought in the wilderness. Instead, he threw his troops into attacks against Lee artillery couldn't support him. It was a terrible place to try to attack anybody. Uh, he lost far more men than, the um, than Lee in the wilderness. That was a defeat. So having nothing else to do in the wilderness, he tried to get to Spotsylvania. And he had the interior line. He had the Abrock Road straight to Spotsylvania. Lee had to cross some um, rivers, small rivers, and had a roundabout route. Sorry. And uh, Lee still got there first mostly because Sheridan, who is Grant's chosen uh, cavalry commander, uh, didn't do well. Um, Warren is usually blamed, but basically it was Sheridan and Grant who made the mistakes. So Lee got to Spotsylvania first. Grant threw his men into attacks all along the line, day after day after day. He basically lost just as many men as he did in the wilderness, and Lee lost just as few, another Union defeat. Having nothing else to do, Grant tried to move again. He made it down to the North Anna. Lee beat him and um, put in a really good effort uh, doing a little V-shaped defensive position that Grant wrapped himself around and realized that he's in trouble. Uh, Lee could attack either of his flanks and he'd be separated by the river twice to reinforce either side. Luckily for him, Lee was sick. The attacks never happened and Grant was able to withdraw before anything bad really occurred. So Grant went down to a Cold Harbor. Sheridan captured the crossroads at first, which is good. Grant made another mistake, though. He wanted Baldy Smith to bring a whole corps from Butler's front and march it up. And at first, he was just going to march it behind his army. And uh, the third time he ordered Baldy Smith, he was supposed to order them to Cold Harbor, where he needed them um, once uh, Sheridan was like, getting outnumbered and uh, Wright's Corps was coming down. So instead of Baldy Smith being ordered to Cold Harbor like Grant wanted, either Grant or a staff member made a mistake and sent them up the river again. Now Grant said in his memoirs, through some means there was a mistake in the orders. Well, Grant should have known who it was. It was either him or the man he gave the orders to, one or the other. So if it wasn't him, he should have known that it was a staff member. But he never took the blame or even assigned the blame um, I'm somewhat assuming that it was Grant, but that's just me. So Cold Harbor was a uh, huge defeat. He just sent his troops along, all along the lines once again. And now he did something that was really bad. I mean, I don't want to use the word butcher, but after Vicksburg, he left his men between the lines, no man's land, for like two days before Pemberton finally said, hey, I'll call a flag of truce for you to get your men from between the lines and help the wounded. Two days after Cold Harbor, Grant had still done nothing. Hancock told um, Meade, he goes, can something be done about these wounded men between the lines? Meade sent up to Grant. He said, Grant, you know, can we do something about these guys? Grant said, sure. If you want to send a flag of truce to suspend the firing, go for it. Meade said, no, I can't do that. Um, you outrank me. When you're on the field, Lee's not going to recognize me as being in command. You have to do it. So what did Grant do? Instead of saying what he just told Meade, a flag of truce to suspend firing, Grant said, well, Lee, when there's no battle raging, I'm going to send out litter bearers to pick up our wounded. How about that? Lee said, no, can't do it. Do it the normal way. Grant said, OK. How, Lee said, well, send a flag in the normal way. So Grant said, OK. I'm going to send stretcher bearers armed with little flags out on the field to pick up the troops still no talk about like suspension of firing and sending litter bearers out between the lines when there's no ceasefire, they're going to get slaughtered. Lee told them again, you can't do it that way, please do it the normal way. Finally, about four days after the battle, Grant finally got it into his head that he'd have to ask for a ceasefire 
And by that time, there were very few troops remaining. Um, I think that's a real blot on his character. Some of his biographers still blame Lee wholly. Some of them just say it was like a muddled discussion or both sides um, deserve blame, but really it was Grant. He had four opportunities to ask for a ceasefire and get his wounded men off the field. He didn't. So after Cold Harbor, he stuck again. Lee even sent a whole corps, Early's Corps, off to the valley. Um, so Grant withdrew from Cold Harbor. He crossed the James, is very well done, thanks to fine Union engineering. But Grant didn't bother telling Meade or Hancock that he was going to try to attack Petersburg. He sent his friend Baldy Smith to try to do it alone. Baldy Smith couldn't do it, and the Confederates were arriving to reinforce that evening when Hancock finally got around. So that maneuver really failed, and the battle was another Union loss, about 10,000 uh, Union casualties to maybe 4,000 Confederate. All during that year, um, Grant lost in battle after battle um, at Petersburg. Um, there's a couple of bright spots when Warren, I think, took part of the Weldon Railroad, but basically it was just more Union defeats. Grant was like throwing men to the left, throwing men to the right, throwing men in the crater directly ahead. And even at the crater, when the uh, mine didn't go off, what did Grant do? He said, I ordered the troops to go ahead anyway, even if the mine didn't go off. So the mine's just waiting to explode, and Grant sent his men over the mine. Thank goodness the mine did go off before that happened. It was still a debacle. And when it came time to ask for a ceasefire, Grant left the field and said to Meade, I'm going back to Fort Monroe. You can do a flag of truce if you want to. So the war was actually won as a matter of attrition. Um, the Union, with better resources, more men, generally just wore the Confederacy out. Um, so all the talk about Grant's strategic ability, I think, is overblown. He really didn't have great tactical ability, and many of his uh, biographers even admit that. So I just take a whole different look at the um, Civil War, and uh, hopefully you will agree with me at least a, to a small extent after all of that. <laughs> so I'm really uh, hoping you've got some tough questions for me, and uh, I look forward to anybody. Any, anybody disagree? Yes, sir. It seemed like in the first three years of the war, we had the same scenario taking place over and over again, which is the Union general would be defeated by the lead yeah. and then would retreat back and say, see you next season. Yeah. And that kind of kept repeating itself, and Grant had the tenacity to not do that. Yeah. And that seemed to be something of really huge value, especially in contrast with the three previous years of fighting, isn't there? So is, is, wasn't there a huge value in the ability to not retreat back after, after getting bloody? Yes. Um, but then, like, uh, Burnside... Okay, but let's say Burnside. I mean, Burnside tried at Fredericksburg, and then he tried the Mud March, but then he was replaced. So he didn't really retreat. Um, Pope was just beaten badly. Um, he was in the Army of the Potomac, but he was still beaten badly. I mean, so he had to retreat, and right afterwards, you know, he was replaced. So he didn't get a real chance to do it. Um, after Antietam, I mean, that wasn't a retreat either. Um, after Chancellorsville, um, yes, they retreated back across the Rapidan. It wasn't a, a long retreat, but it was a retreat. But then they had to respond to Lee's, you know, Gettysburg campaign. So yes, you're true, and I give Grant credit for being, you know, um, he was aggressive and he was persistent. Um, so he, de he definitely g does get credit for doing that. Um, but I don't think that's what make. That's not the only thing that really makes a good general. That helps. You need that, but it's not the only thing involved. But thank you. Sherman with the smaller force 
because H.H. Uh, uh, Smith never, I mean, he, they, never, they never caught up with him again. Uh, he was still in Mississippi, I think. And Sherman was a smaller force. And the way that ridge runs, and the way the railroad runs, from a strategic perspective, it seems to me that the plan, forgetting who he wanted to win the battle, right. the better plan was to have Sherman roll up the line because oh. the railroad's right behind him. The line of retreat oh. is from the right, the Confederate's right. So rolling him up from the top of the picture to the bottom makes more strategic sense. Okay. Can, I, not. can I interrupt you? I'll, I'll agree with you completely. But I think it was Baldy Smith's plan. But yeah, Grant took it, and it's a great plan to you know cross the enemy, cross the river when the enemy's not looking, roll up the um, ridge, you know, use some help from the center. It definitely was a good plan. I, I have no question about that. I mean, it was just the, the, the tactical errors made by, by Sherman in, in attacking the wrong hill. Yeah. Of course, the, he, was, he was up against Patrick Cleburne, who we all know is an yeah. excellent, uh, excellent general. But it just seemed to me that that's where you wanted to push them yeah. off the mountain because then you oh. reach the railroad. Uh, not permit them to retreat the I, I completely agree. But do you have a question also, or do, can I? No, that, oh, I mean, okay. question, was that not the Oh, best? yeah, that, that was. Um, getting whatever Hooker might have been able to do by going to, going to Rossville, I mean, that was a threat, of course. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know how much of a plan that, I think, I think Hooker uh, was an overachiever there. I don't know what, you know, how much Grant was looking for him to, to win the battle. I oh, he Yes, and in um, Grant's memoirs, he did say, oh yes, Hooker's appearance on the ridge was supposed to be the signal for sending my troops forward. That was all just made up. Yeah, yeah. He, he, wa he wasn't looking toward Hooker at all. He was looking at Sherman. That's but the way I understand. Yeah. So when um, he first got to be um, commander of the military division of the Mississippi, Grant was trying to get rid of Hooker, even before the Cracker Line operations, which Hooker didn't do perfectly well at with the Battle of Wauhatchie and his disposition of troops. But he was trying to get rid of Hooker right from the beginning, whether it was because he had high rank or whether somebody didn't like him. <laughs> Slocum wouldn't even serve Slocum was another one, yeah. And he tried to get rid of Slocum, too. He wanted Howard. Grant picked Howard as his favorite for the you know, day. And he was trying to push Howard for it as much as possible. So in his battle plans, he took um, Howard's force from Hooker and sent them up to um, you know, help on this side of the battlefield, he really was trying to keep, um, I'm pretty sure, Hooker out of the battle. It was only because like, Hooker had these extra men, two brigades of Thomas's that came up from the rear and Sherman's division that was left behind that gave him the firepower to do it. But really it was Thomas and Hooker who pushed that one forward. Um, but then of course, Grant took credit for it later on. But no, very good, uh, yes? Um. supports the army in the first place. And Stoker makes the case that Grant was very good at not only getting along with the Lincoln administration, but executing their increasingly hard war plans. And for Stoker, that's part of um, Grant's greatness. Okay. Uh, you didn't mention very much about the political relationship mm. side of Grant during the war. Perhaps mm. you'd like to Okay. Well, in the West, he was sort of left alone a bit. I think one of the um, problems with the serving in the East is that you had everybody looking at you. So the uh, federal commanders in the East got a lot more flack doing anything that they did. The commanders in the West had a little bit more leeway. But by the time Grant arrived in the East, Lincoln really gave him carte blanche. It was like, you know, Grant even said he gave me everything I needed. He didn't meddle with Grant's plans. Um, so. The administration didn't, the Grant didn't have to follow the administration's you know, lead on that. Um, the administration followed his lead. Whatever Grant wanted, whether it's stripping the D.C. garrisons, Grant got it. Yeah, I think you're referring to the military, oh. strictly military aspect. I think Stoker and others were referring to Grant's implementation of policies about the freedmen, the okay. policies of the hard war that the Lincoln administration was pushing, that okay. a lot of generals both Okay. So perhaps your comment on yeah. that. 
Okay. Um, one example, let's say, of Grant allowing his favoritism to outrank the administration's policies, the administration wanted black troops raised. Sherman basically said, not in my military division, once he took over the military division of the Mississippi. And he was basically insubordinate to Lincoln, and Grant let him be insubordinate to Lincoln. And um, Sherman wasn't forced to raise troops. Sherman, I forgot what the words he used, but he basically said, anybody who wants to try to come down here to raise black troops, I'm going to give them a gun and send them to the front lines. Um, so there, at least, Grant wasn't following the administration policy. Um, so I'm sure there's other examples. And yes, uh, he did you know, help raise um, black troops in the Mississippi. Um, he'd be foolish not to. Um, but I don't see him getting like, great credit, more credit than other generals in following the political desires of the administration and of Lincoln. Um, except that McClellan, of course, is an outlier. Um, he was certainly no friend of the administration. Well, when it came to the administration, I, I can't speak that well. But, um, well, but Grant did during the Mississippi River expedition that was supposed to be McLaren. He, d he was also insubordinate to Lincoln again. I should have expressed that. That Lincoln had chosen McLaren as the commander. And what did Halleck and Grant do? And not just you know, saying that we're going to do this. They did it surreptitious surreptitiously. They excluded McLaren from being commander. Uh, Military music. Um, so he well, really. They, he, they did because he sent he sent Sherman down down river on several of his expeditions, uh, so that when McClellan arrived, there was no army. From the right. So he's basically going against Lincoln's expressed desire that McClellan was the thing. So, at least in a military respect, he didn't follow Lincoln's um, wishes a couple times. But, but McClellan was a traitor. <laughs> I mean, he was uh, in Washington. Impugning the administration to, to let him. To, yeah. Um, is that the worst thing in the world? And there's worse things than that. Well, not from the perspective of the commander on, on the field. He was otherwise doing a decent okay. job. Okay. And also, um, Grant's uh, <coughs> district was only up down to northern Mississippi. His district didn't include Vicksburg. So sending down an expedition down to Vicksburg wasn't really in Grant's department. Well, there was uh, nobody in that department. Right? So I think Lincoln had the uh, authority to send McLaren if he wanted to with the troops that Grant didn't need. And uh, Grant didn't need them because Grant sent Sherman back with a division. And uh, so basically they stole McLaren's. And if it worked out better, you might, there might be a point to all of this. But since Sherman failed so miserably, you've got to say, well, Grant not only was insubordinate, but he made the wrong decision sending Sherman down with these troops because if it didn't work. Ah. Uh, that's uh, very interesting. Um, uh, I don't know enough about Island Number Ten. Um, well, and the same idea. passing. Yes, yeah, the Yep. And I even have in my book that um, I think the Naval Administration, the Secretary of War, basically had wanted Porter to pass Vicksburg even before Grant had come to that decision. So the whole decision about passing um, Vicksburg with the uh, gunboats, I don't think was Grant's. And the decision to make a second passage with the transports, which you need to cross the Mississippi with your troops, I think that was McLaren's idea. So like this, all this credit that's given to Grant for Vicksburg, um, it really gets chipped away piece by piece until it's a little bit more manageable. Grant really wasn't up here. I'm not sure if he's here or here or here, but he certainly wasn't up here. He's only up here in his memoirs and in his biographers um, and in his annotated memoirs. But yes. Yes. <laughs> 
I think he had access to his records, and he had Bado there in the beginning. Um, yeah, because he kept, I think, his records um, at hand. I'm not positive. Um, he also wrote his uh, article on Shiloh for Century Magazine, I think, before he got sick. Um, and also, he said that he did this to the best of his ability. I'm pretty sure he didn't. Um, so I think he had the ability to write it better. He was, once he got sick, he um, was using cocaine and morphine and alcohol alleviate his you know pain so he certainly was like struggling and it was a valiant struggle to write his memoirs um, you know he was bankrupt because of a grant and ward um, a Ponzi scheme that really he and his family were part of unknowingly um, so he was he loved his family he loved his wife he's a great family man and I'm sure he was doing it to save his family's you know position uh, so you can get credit for that but in the contents of the memoirs not so much and, sir I thought he was being a little soft on Grant, um, as a lot of people know. When Grant was um, department commander in West Tennessee, um, there was a lot of cotton trading going on. His own father was down there cotton trading. John, J. Russell Jones, who was his sort of financial advisor, he was down there trading, and profitably so. Charles Dana, his friend, tried to trade, and there's two people, including Dana, who said, oh, I didn't make any money, basically, that's what he implied. And two other people sort of implied that he was sort of successful at it before he went against the trading. So there's cotton trading going on, and the grant was giving out um, permits to trade in cotton, but for some reason he didn't want Jews trading cotton. And not only did he try to kick Jewish cotton traders out of his department, he kicked all Jews out of his department, as a class, man, woman, child, grand, and luckily, it wasn't um, enforced completely, but it certainly was enforced to some degree. Um, and he even tried to uh, explain himself later by saying, oh, um, if I had thought about it, I would have like, retracted it. Well, he had about three weeks to think about it before Lincoln heard about it and made him countermand the order. He didn't do it willingly. He did it under orders. Um, so even though he was later a friend of um, many Jewish people, um, they vo many of them voted for him as president. He sent over a um, representative to Romania to help stop like the um, programs against the Romanian Jews, Benjamin Pashato. And so that was, you know, a very good thing. But at the time during the war, what he did was this blatant anti-Semitism and there's really no excuse for it. Um, even if he sent out omitted um, Jewish traitors, that would have been sort of bad enough is, you know, it's still discriminatory. But kicking out all Jews as a class, I'm not sure how you could come to that um, conclusion. Thank you. Yes? Uh, you point out here that at Chattanooga, for example, the plan was good. Yep. At Vicksburg, the plan was good. Is it, is it, is the point that his generalship was poor or is it that he took credit from those who should have gotten more of it and assigned blame when he should have accepted more of it? Yes. Did he accept blame for himself? No. Did he accept blame for Sherman or Sheridan or others' friends? No. If he didn't like you, Warren, Rosecrans, Thomas, McLaren, and Lou Wallace, you name it, he'd blame you when you weren't even you know, supposed to be blamed. He was blaming Warren for the crater. Um, so yeah, his favoritism was really running amok um, in his writings. Um, you, how did you start out your? Oh, I said oh, oh, in Chattanooga. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, okay, a lot of both. Because at Chattanooga, I'm pretty sure it was um, Baldy Smith who had planned Sherman's um, crossing. So even though Grant was smart enough to 
you know, choose that as a plan, um, I don't think he came up with it. And uh, some of the other plans were other people's ideas. In the Vicksburg campaign, though, a lot of that was his ideas. The um, Yazoo Pass and the Lake Providence route and the canal, those were Grant and um, the Steals by You. Those were all Grant's decisions and they all failed. But then he tried to, like, you know, shuffle off blame or, you know, not claim anything. And his actual crossing sort of came about, I think, because of Rawlins and McLaren suggesting, you know, uh, passing Vicksburg and crossing below, and the Navy Department saying, Porter, David Dixon Porter, you should cross your gunboats or pass your gunboats down. Um, and then once he uh, crossed the river, there's sort of two stories. Grant at one point said, I had the whole thing planned af right after my crossing, what I was going to do. And at another time he said, well, I was sort of playing it by ear, you know, things that sort of happened and I followed them around. Either way it worked, and he did well in that, but you know, I think a lot of that was a sort of uh, circumstances and a lot of good luck. Pemberton was sort of a, a stationary p commander. He, he wasn't a really good um, opponent um, during that. Uh, so yes, Grant was, Grant achieved some great results, but whether Grant gets like this 100% credit for the results or 70% credit or 20% credit, that's a different matter altogether. Thank you very much. And and I make a pitch for my book. <laughs> and, 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 ju and just lastly, my book is for sale. If you're at all interested, it's $30. It's usually $37.50 on Amazon. It's stuffed with information. It's very fat. But if you like Grant, you'll still probably hate it. So. <laughs> Um, that one I created. A lot of them I took from Hal Jesperson, who allows people to take his Wikipedia maps, and then I took them into like um, Adobe Illustrator, and then played around with them and made them look what I wanted them to look like. Oh, the, I, the one on um, Shiloh I really like. It's another relief map, um, and I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. You know, I, I to, to me, you know, because I was asking about, you know, I mean, of course they screwed him pretty, pretty, pretty well, uh, <laughs> but deservedly so. Even though he was a good general, yeah, he um, performed very well. Donaldson, Shiloh, uh, Arkansas Post, Belmont. Uh, you know, Belmont had a